All right. So today we're going to build on what we learned with CSS and learn how to use some tools that will do a good amount of the work of, of applying CSS for us, though we still have to know CSS well because we will need to modify stuff and also to understand how these tools work. Um, and there's what are called CSS frameworks. And then with React, those frameworks get turned into what's often called like UI component libraries. And we're gonna look at two of them today. Um, later in the class, because later in the second half of the class, because Bootstrap is a bit more um, batteries included and heavyweight, we'll look at Bootstrap. Bootstrap was actually created by Twitter. It's been around for ages. Um, and it does, there's, let's see if they have, they have all sorts of interesting examples of things you can do. But for instance, here, if we want to look at what's called uh, hero text, which is when you go to a website and you see this big sort of title centered, Bootstrap gives you a whole bunch of pre-built CSS classes for doing this and making it responsive. Um, for a common layout, as they say here, like a left aligned hero text with an image on the right. And note that again, this is responsive where it shifted into just a straight one column layout when we hit, if you all remember media breakpoints where different C rules get applied when you hit a certain screen size, that's how CSS frameworks like Bootstrap implement a lot of this stuff. And they've just, because it's been around, they've just tweaked and refined it to all work really, really well. Um, and just as another example, there's things to like, um, for dropdowns, really nice user experience and interactions. Bootstrap, in fact, combines CSS and JavaScript. So there's um, the Bootstrap framework includes some JavaScript along with, it's not just pure CSS. And I would have thought the filtering would have been interactive, but maybe that has to be implemented. And let's see another good example. Uh, the modal is a good example. We can't close it right now, but it gives us a lot of different styles of modals. Um, the nav bar and, and buttons are classic examples. So there's just lots of like UI. It's not a re not components in the sense of React components, but really common UI pieces that Bootstrap has just built out and and gives us CSS and and JavaScript for. Um, and let's see if there is, and you can make custom components and do all these things. Um, and let's just see if we can't find a little bit of the actual HTML and CSS to take a look at, um, like let's search for their nav bar. So, We'll learn this later, but to give you all a bit of a preview and to see what these things look like, and their documentation here is pretty great. Here's what you end up getting, a nav bar with drop downs and a search box and all of these things built in um, and flex box and stuff like that built in. And let's see, why did I lose? There it is. And the way that we do it is there are some custom, well, nav is actually an HTML element, but we use all of these CSS classes that are part of Bootstrap, and we have to install their CSS files, their, their CSS framework and, and JavaScript code. Um, we'll actually see there's an easier way to do this with React. We, it, we get a bunch of React Bootstrap components, but just to kind of show you what the pure HTML and CSS looks like for this, 
as you can see, there's a lot of pieces here, right? But then we have a nav bar that we can use across our whole page. And all of these CSS classes aren't ones that we write, they're ones that are created by Bootstrap. And there's things like color schemes, um, there's all sorts of just complex and interesting behaviors as well. Um, like button element is a good example here. Like if you go all in on Bootstrap and you choose like your color theme and your and you set it up, um, then depending on like the different categories of buttons, there might be different colors. And by default, as you can see, like a success button is green. And we just use this button success class that Bootstrap gives us. And there's a red button for warnings. So it's extremely powerful and, and batteries included. Um, and if we do a quick search for sites made with Bootstrap and, and let's see what we find. So Etsy, that's probably a good one to look at because that's a pretty well-known site. So this is a great example of how you could, the value of something like Bootstrap, when you have a big complex site, like say the Etsy e-commerce site. And again, we'll see how you can use Bootstrap with React um, when, we, when we look at it. Um, but you can see, especially if you start thinking about components, we've got a big nav bar up here, right? And the nav bar has two rows and the first row has our logo and a hamburger menu and a search box and then some other buttons here. And the second row has these other ones. And then we have this sort of hero text that's their new spring fashions and this. And then you we can see here that we've got a row and each column is, is something that we're interested in as well. Um, and if we look at like some of the classes over here Like we, we can sort of start to see what this looks like, right? So this is a pretty complex site if, if you start to dig into it. And this is a great example of where using a framework like Bootstrap can, can help. Um, what we're gonna take a look at first before we dive into Bootstrap is um, a CSS framework called Tailwind that's a bit more recent and um, a bit less batteries included and a bit more utilitarian. And so it's a, a friendlier intro and a, a lot of folks really, really love Tailwind. And if we kind of look at some examples, we can kind of see what it does. For example, here, what they're showing us is, um, and this is common with like Bootstrap has a version of this as well. Instead of having to write our own CSS classes where we define a width and how to do things like shadowed and rounded, Tailwind gives us these utility classes to do that. And we can combine a bunch of them here to get different divs of different widths. Um, and we can kind of see that in action here with this sort of e-commerce card, sort of similar to what you see on Etsy that they built as well where again, all of these CSS classes come from Tailwind. And note that there's a flex container class here. There's a class to set a font. Um, there's a class for really all of the things that we want to do. And, and the advantage here is that a lot of setup work has been done for us and we can sort of like maintain a certain standard. So as we dig into these, um, We're gonna start off with Tailwind. And we're gonna see how to install and configure it with React and Beat. And then we're gonna see really like a tour of the Tailwind fundamentals of using it for fonts, for uh, border, or margin and padding, um, some nice things with width and height and um, responsive design, and then with Flexbox. 
And then when we get into Bootstrap, we'll see again how to install it with React and V. Um, and we'll look at um, some of the most popular Bootstrap components, such as the button, the nav bar, and we'll look at the Bootstrap grid as well, which is pretty incredible. And if we have time, maybe a modal. And that'll take us pretty far. Um, and really, this is with React Bootstrap. So we'll see this much more lightweight utility library first, and then we'll see this very powerful, more mature, sort of opinionated batteries included library. So I just want to check in to see if folks have any questions before we start um, diving into Tailwind about sort of what we're covering today or sort of a little bit of the big picture of these frameworks. And let me um, catch up on our Slack channel as well. I do see a question, whiskey questions. When using these different CSS frameworks, do you consider which ones take up the most space during a build? Um, that's a great question. You might. However, what we'll learn is that um, the tools that are used to build React apps, which when we run NPM, like the, the V dev server, NPM run dev, it does that for us. Uh, there is a lot of optimization already built into that process with all of these tools. And space is probably not the primary concern because of that, because they're all going to get optimized to a degree. So um, unless, yeah, sh short answer is some optimization happens automatically and probably like usability and developer productivity is going to be the more important thing to uh, think about when kind of like evaluating these frameworks. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, totally. That no, that's 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 a great question. All right, let's start taking a look at Tailwind. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to. Um, create a new uh, directory in React project real quick. And I'm just going to call it, let's call it component libraries. So that's not quite, that would help if I created it first. Um, My apologies, my fingers can't seem to get where I want. And I'm going to hit Control R to do a backwards search for the V command to create a new V project and spin that up. And it's just going to be basic JavaScript and React. I'm going to npm install. And we'll give that a minute. And then I'll do npm run dev. And now we should have our dev server. And in fact, instead of Etsy, let's go ahead and let's close Bootstrap too, because we'll look at that later. And let's look at our dev server. And we've got this running. And I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of the stuff in AppJSX that we don't want. We're not going to use any of this right now. And I'm just going to put an H1 in there just so I know that something is rendering that says, hello world. And I'm going to go ahead and just get rid of all of this CSS. So installing Tailwind includes a couple steps that will take us a bit deeper into the world of React and React build tools. 
So let's see what that's like. And I'm actually going to use the Tailwind docs as a guide here um, to see what they recommend doing. So we have to use this npm install dash d command with Tailwind. And if I Google that real quick, let's see what the I suspect the dash D is maybe for development. I'm actually not certain. Um, let's see if chat GPT can tell us. And it is indeed, I, I thought this was the case, save dev, and we'll see what that does in a second. It's a way for NPM to keep track of which packages are needed for a production build versus a, a development build. So we're gonna be installing this Tailwind CSS package. However, there's actually um, a couple extra NPM packages we need to install to use Tailwind the way that we want to. So our install command is, and this is in the, um, This is in the the curriculum docs, so for to as a reference. And let's go ahead and make this bigger so we can see it. It's going to be npm install dash d tailwind css, and let me make sure I'm in the right directory. I am npm install dash d tailwind css, and I'm installing three different npm packages um, in the same command here a very powerful package called post CSS and another uh, very common one that's used along with post CSS called auto pre prefixer. And very briefly, post CSS is kind of amazing. It lets you like run your CSS through JavaScript and sort of do processing to it and adds all these very powerful speech features the biggest of which is like modules and namespacing. So I can have different CSS files and have like the same class in different files and post CSS will like add on something to that name. So those names don't conflict. And so if I take a quick look in my package.json, uh, what I see is that all this stuff got installed into um, my dev dependencies, meaning that these don't get installed when I create a production build. And Tailwind, we may or may not need to add um, for a production build, but this is okay right now. So that's the difference between um, a normal install and the dash dash save dev if they get installed here or here. So now that I've done that, I do have to make a couple other changes. And in fact, um, I have to run a command called npx, which lets us run an npm package from the command line. So now that we've installed the Tailwind npm package, it's got a little JavaScript program in there that we need to run that will initialize Tailwind CSS for our project. And in fact, instead of npm, this definitely needs to be npx. Right, so npx let it lets us run an npm module from the command line. Not every module is meant to do that. Tailwind, it, it is, and so let's run this and see what happens. So it tells us right here it created some config files for Tailwind and post CSS, and they're both JavaScript files. Let's take a quick look. Um, note that that other package auto prefixer that we installed is actually a post CSS plugin. And all this post CSS tailwind config stuff, um, the most important thing is just knowing the steps to run. I wanted to dig under under the hood a little bit, but you won't have to touch or modify this stuff that much. Um, the one change we do need to make is here in tailwind CSS. And as you can see, there's things like plugins and a theme, but we need to tell tailwind um, what content we're going to be using 
these tailwind classes with, because um, we haven't gone into this too much, but to kind of touch on what you were asking about, Landon, if we go up to look at scripts, there is this build script here, rebuild that we've never really used. And that's what actually like looks at the JSX and turns it into JavaScript that a browser can read. And it now is doing all sorts of sort of pre-processing stuff with our CSS to create what's called a bundle, which is like a, a little, a JavaScript file with everything packed into it efficiently as it can be and, and CSS and image assets properly connected. Um, and our V dev server does this automatically for us. Uh, so we haven't had to really think about this. Um, but so we do have to tell Tailwind what, where to go to do some of this pre-processing. So we have to tell it where the index.html file is because it is going to actually add like uh, uh, like C a link tag to or a script tag to load a Tailwind CSS file. And we need to tell it where our React components are that we're going to be using the Tailwind CSS in, which is in the source directory. And then the two stars means all the directories in here. And then I'm saying, I want you to look at all the files and all, almost all our code has the .jsx file extension. You can write normal JavaScript files, like if you've got JS utility functions that you're importing somewhere else. So in the curly brackets, we are going to put more than one file extension that we want um, to tell Tailwind to make sure to look at. And I actually don't need the dot there. So it will just be JSX and JS. And we're not using TypeScript, but the TS and TSX are for TypeScript. And because it comes from, um, like if you dig around in the config docs, they sort of recommend this. Um, and also just to cover our bases, if we use TypeScript later, we can, we'll just add that in now and it won't hurt. Um, and we're almost done. Right, I've added a couple modifications to the Tailwind install steps here. And again, it is important to, to read the docs on new libraries as you start installing and using them because there will be more, more steps here. And we can see something pretty similar to, to what we did to tell Tailwind where sort of our template files are. And then we are going to have to make a modification to one of our CSS files to use this special like at Tailwind command, which will import a bunch of Tailwind CSS into our CSS. And this we're going to do in index.css. So I'm going to go ahead and save this and close this. And let's open up index.css. And can anyone remind me why might we want to do this in index.css as opposed to app.css? What's the difference between app.css and index.css? Uh, Yams, yes, sir. Index is at the root. Say that again. Index is at the root. Uh, yes. Let's see where they get used. So index.css gets imported here in main.jsx. And then app CSS gets imported here. And remember, main.jsx is sort of where we initialize, configure, bootstrap, launch our whole React app, whatever you want to call it. So something like Tailwind that we're going to use for all our CSS everywhere kind of makes sense to put here as sort of like a global config setting. And also, this way, it gets loaded into the index CSS um, so that if we wanted to use any Tailwind stuff in app.css, it's already ready to go. So that should be it, um, fingers crossed. And the first thing you always want to do after installing and doing some config stuff like this is make sure that your program runs. So let's do a sanity check here and run this. And this looks about right. And let's do a little exploring and, and see what we see.
So if I look in the head of my HTML doc, I thought I saw something Tailwind related hiding in here. Index.css, app.css. Maybe it's not loaded. It was right there yet. when you clicked on it, wasn't it? When you clicked on style, it's a tailwind right under there. Oh, I I might just be. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um my eyes were just skipping over it. Um, so the V build steps actually injected all of this Tailwind CSS into index CSS for us. And like, if we like, let's poke around in the network requests and look at the CSS files. And if we look at, let's find one that, there we go. So here we can see there's all this JavaScript and it's, it's probably loading Tailwind. So this is a little harder to see. And I think probably looking here is the best way to see it where we can see all of this stuff with Tailwind got injected. I don't wanna dive um, too much into that, but, but we've now got Tailwind um, up and running. I just I do want to pause and check in and see if folks have any questions or if there's questions in a uh, whiskey chat. Um, Jordan uh, Edge, great question about GitHub pages and Vite. That's a little outside scope. Um, I believe with GitHub pages, there are tools, but you need to end up with like static HTML, CSS, and JavaScript for GitHub pages to host. So there's a way to do that, but it's a bit more complex and, and a topic for uh, another day. Uh, but if you Google Jekyll, uh, that, that's kind of the classic tool for, for doing that with, with React type stuff. Uh, so again, these install steps are just something that you want to follow through and, and do. Um, there's not, you're never going to need to tweak these that much. Let's apply a little bit of tailwind and see it in action and then maybe take a break. And actually the one other thing I do want to show is there's going to be a couple VS code extensions we're going to want to install with tailwind. So this one is from the company that makes tailwind tailwind labs that will give us really nice auto completion and syntax highlighting and make it a lot easier to work with Tailwind. Um, I haven't seen this one before, but actually this doesn't look bad. It lets us look at Tailwind docs. So why not? I'll go ahead and install that one. And then I, I do recommend, and th again, this is in the curriculum doc, uh, this Tailwind fold feature. We're gonna be writing lots of Tailwind utility classes and this kind of lets us collapse them in line. And we'll see what that looks like as we get into it. So with Tailwind, um, let me go ahead and close out extensions because we don't need that. And we don't need that. And let's look at app CSS and let's look at app JSX. So, you know, I might decide that I want some text to be read and some other text to be blue. And so maybe I want, you know, my H1, uh, my title for this, I want this to be red. And maybe I want 
this to be blue. And it looks like I've got a typo over here in my CSS because I'm so used to typing the semicolon. And note, this is that Tailwind fold extension. Um, which let's disable that for the moment. Let me go into extensions and let's look at Tailwind Fold and let's disable it for now. Um, it's requiring a reload, so I apologize. We're not gonna worry about disabling it for the moment. Um, if it becomes a real pain, I will, I will disable it. And let's actually see if maybe there's like a setting I can change real quick. Yeah, um, I'll come if if this becomes a problem, let me know. Um, but let's say we also want, and in fact, I already feel like this is a problem. So let's just do this real quick. There we go. Sorry about that. Tailwind fold, super useful for developing, less so for teaching. And for some reason, maybe I decided I want my paragraph to be underlined as well. And let's see why tomorrow was cloudy is not blue. Actually, let's take a quick look at that because it should be blue. So there's Adam, all this. You just need to restart your NPM dev. Oh, that would do it, wouldn't it? Thank you so much. I'm kind of shocked that, there we go. Thank you so much. My brain went totally down the wrong road there. So let's say I want both of these elements to be blue, but then I want the paragraph one to be underlined as well. So now I have a choice, right? I can either do something like this. And I change what this class is. So that's one option. Or the other is maybe I decide, you know what? I'm gonna make a new class. I'm gonna call it underlined because in fact, it's not just underlined. When I underline text, I also want it to be uh, italic. So let's do, let's see, is it text? Emphasis. Uh, does anyone actually remember how to make italic text uh, in CSS? Let's actually ask ChatGPT. Then ChatGPT is taking an awfully long time here. Font style, of course, not text decoration, but font style.
which is a meaningful but subtle difference. And maybe my paragraph class, I apply both of these. And really this is, let's say, th this is my, uh, you know, emphasized text class now that I'm starting to add things to it. And this is not an uncommon pattern with CSS. And this is actually what Tailwind um, helps us with because Tailwind has set up a lot of this for us already. And I apologize, just one moment. Sorry about that. Um, I just had to make sure I had the code I'm going to write with Tailwind prepped. And so this is right not using any CSS framework. And this is why Tailwind is called a utility framework because what I can do with Tailwind is let's, it gives me like thousands of built-in classes that all follow a very specific pattern. And actually, I apologize. That is for if we want to change the color of its underline, let's try something like this. There we go. So now for my H2 that I want blue, I can use text blue. And now for my paragraph tag where I'm saying tomorrow is cloudy, I can do text is blue. And I believe it is, let's see if I have this right. And this is where um, one of those, that IntelliSense uh, extension for, for Tailwind that I installed comes into play. Let's see if we can get this right to get the underline. I don't think that's quite it. Let's try. And this is the trade-off of, of a framework like um, Tailwind is you have to you have to learn it. And I think it might actually just be underlined. And there we go. In fact, it was it was so simple that it was escaping me. And let me pop back to uh, AppJSX. And I can also do things like change the opacity. And what Tailwind has is it's just created literally hundreds of different CSS classes. So there's a CSS class named text-red. And there's a CSS class named text-red-700 that sets the text to red and increases the, the opacity. And same here with text blue. Like each of these is its own CSS class. Um, and that's why we had kind of have to do this build tool setup because all these Tailwind CSS classes are sort of getting created by, by JavaScript because as you can see, it's a lot. 
And in fact, we can also do, I believe, um, let's see, was it text? There's all sorts of interesting things that we can do. For instance, underline offset eight. So I don't know if you all just noticed, but notice that that underline just jumps down. And the advantage of using a CSS utility library like Tailwind is that a lot of these like numbers are pre-computed. So they're all kind of like look nice. And we don't have to like think about the number of pixels ourselves. Um, and uh, I believe to change like the color of the text decoration, it's just decoration dash black. And now my underline is a different color. So this is also where that uh, Tailwind Fold uh, VS Code plugin starts to become useful because this is a lot of stuff. But the idea here is rather than for all this sort of utility stuff, like writing all these class CSS classes that do barely basic stuff. And if I want, I absolutely can like, use Tailwind CSS inside here. Um, Though so that I think actually gets a little more complicated and probably doesn't make sense with React and React components, to be honest, like, because there's no reason for us to do this like this, like what would make more sense is we would make a really simple React component that had a P tag and the CSS that we want and that passed in as a prop what we wanted it to show. Um, and I saw uh, a hand up. Um, let me go ahead and check whiskey questions and, and take some questions. So um, there was a question, how can you tell if the app is styling based on the Tailwind inline shorthand or the app CSS styles uh, since they have the same name? Oh, that is a good question. So these names have been changed now since this is text.shred700. Um, I think you're correct, Brian. There would have been a naming conflict if I left these the same. Um, and let's, in fact, let's just name these something else so we can just avoid that. Because you're right, we would have a naming conflict there and that's not what we want. Uh, and I saw someone had their hand up. Uh, Saul, yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to, so I noticed your H1 and H2 elements, and they both became the same size. Um, is that just Tailwind overriding the default font size for H1 and H2 elements? Uh, I doubt it. I think just, so Let's see what the, that's a good point, actually. Let's see real quick if we can see if there are any styles being applied. Um, so the H2 is 16 pixels. Um, that all does seem to be inherited. You know, I don't remember off the top of my head I, I think you're you you very well may be right there. And it does seem to be coming from the tailwind stuff. I think you might be right. And my guess is that it's because like let's search for header in tailwind. So I think there's probably a Tailwind theme setting, but what Tailwind has, though we're gonna get into this a bit later, though this is actually good to see, and this is both Tailwind and Bootstrap, 
is like it will give you text sizes. I note that we're using REM here. So I believe that makes it relative to the HTML element. So you would set like your, your standard sort of font size for the whole page. And then all of these are relative to that. And the idea of these kinds of frameworks is like you buy into the system so that all of your, everything is proportional to each other. And, and it's set up to, to do that for you, uh, but also to give you control. And so like, if we look at some of these, let's see. So extra small, small base, right? So this is the baseline, large, extra large. So let's see what happens if here we add, um, so I don't know if, so Tailwind, is okay with me doing these two text tags. And if we wanted to make this much larger, we'd probably wanna change like the default font size for Tailwind. What I can do though, that makes this even easier is I can just add that. Um, I thought I could add that. Um, but I apologize, I guess that's not the case. And, and Tailwind wants me to do it like this as two separate text tags. Um, and so let's make this much larger, in fact, so that we can see it. Let's make this like eight Excel. There we go. How about four? And now for the H2, I can do text blue, text, let's say, to Excel. And so then they're proportional to each other. Um, yeah, it's a great question, Saul. Thank you. Uh, what other questions do folks have? Awesome. So let's uh, just do a quick recap of, of what we kind of went over and then let's take a break. And we'll look at a bit more Tailwind stuff. And then we'll take a look at, at Bootstrap. Today's a bit more of a, of a lecture day. It's I think the goal will be, uh, if I can, to wrap us up a bit early just to give you more work time to play with these. So just to kind of wrap up, um, we saw that Tailwind CSS, it's a utility CSS framework. It gives us all of these utility classes. To install it, we do have to go through some extra steps um, and please do follow our curriculum install installation instructions because there's one or two minor differences. Um, and I have to scroll down. There we go. This is what I wanted to show. Right. We had to install not just Tailwind, but Post CSS and Auto Prefixer. We then had to use this npx command to run the Tailwind CSS npm package to run some JavaScript to configure stuff. And that created post CSS config JS, which we don't really have to touch. But we did have to touch tailwind.config JS to add to this content array to tell it where is all the files that will have CSS that Tailwind needs to know about, uh, both at index.html and all of our React component in JavaScript files where we might be importing a CSS file. Because when NP when Vite does its build step, whether with running the dev server or later on we'll learn how to do it with production, it like generates a lot of this CSS and injects it in as, as we saw. Um, and then using Tailwind is pretty straightforward. It's really just about learning the tools that, that Tailwind gives us and their, their docs are really great here, um, I have to say. And installing that Tailwind IntelliSense um, extension, which will help us a ton. And so like just to, and just as a sanity check, let's make sure that it wasn't. So I think that for text colors, it does require you to give some sort of opacity and 500 is the standard. Note that if I get rid of that, that goes away. 
But if I add in that number, that that comes back. And that sort of makes sense. And we saw that we apply multiple tailwind classes to add like multiple levels of styling to our application and that it can get really um, robust because there was a uh, Oh, here it is. Because we with the underline, we can add an underline offset. We can change the color of what's underlined. And here again, let's actually add in the numbers so that the blue color gets applied. So it lets us do like very powerful styling and has a lot of that stuff set up for us. Um, you do then sort of have to learn Tailwind, but that's why a lot of people love it. Because once you learn it, it sort of follows a pattern and you can write that code very quickly. So let's take 10, and then when we reconvene, I'll demo a bit more of Tailwind. We'll look at um, some things for width and height. We'll look at some stuff for responsive design and for pseudo classes and Flexbox. And then we'll start getting into React. Uh, sound good? Awesome. Thank you very much, everyone, and see you all in 10 minutes. All right, so we've seen how to install and configure Tailwind with uh, React and V, and we've looked a bit at fonts. Let's look at some other nice features just to get a tour of Tailwind for things like border and margin and padding. And we'll also see Tailwind with responsive design and, and Flexbox. So let me go ahead and pull up app and split this and I think what I'll do is I'll do the the horizontal split since we don't really need um, we don't really need to see the the terminal because it's not there's not a lot of errors that are going to be happening when I'm developing. So does this work okay for folks to have the CSS on the bottom and then the the JSX for the component at the top? Cool. All right, and I, you know, I am using the Tailwind docs as as a reference uh, because I don't have all this stuff memorized. And when I'm developing, I just always have these open in a tab. And for instance, if we just search here through the box for for border, like we'll start to find all the interesting stuff here. And note that the sort of syntax of these Tailwind CSS classes is familiar to what we've seen. It's short, it's succinct, right? We just use the word border and then a dash for the different modifiers. Um, and here, these are the different border modifier sizes. And, and also note that the docs tell us the actual pixel sizes. Um, and here for the border width, it is indeed pixels. It's not rem or em or anything like that. So as you get deeper into using whether it's Tailwind or Bootstrap, you'll be referring to the docs more and more because they'll give you nice specifics about exactly what border dash for it is. So let's just go ahead and create a button. And let's just have this button to say, click me. And let's shift this off to the side of it because we don't need it. And let's look at inside the root div where our whole React app is. We've got our click me button and we can kind of see what happens to it. In fact, as we start adding in some Tailwind styles. So let's do order two. And note that this class got applied that has this border width property of two pixels. Um, and again, that border class is coming from, from Tailwind. And let's go ahead and add more, um, more modifications here. 
let's maybe change the color of the bordering. And I don't think it lets us combine them like this, but let's see. Yeah, I think Tailwind wants wants us to be a bit more verbose. Let's make the border green. Um, and note that I'm getting this really nice autocomplete of the Tailwind classes. There we go. Apparently green might was maybe not a valid color. If I type this again, if I'm using autocomplete, let's see what happens. Maybe I need the color grade, as, and indeed I do, as, as we saw with the other one. And I apologize, let me bring back So in general with Tailwind, when we're using colors, we usually will probably need to apply like the opacity setting for the color that we want. And we can also do things like rounding the borders, um, you know, and, and the solid and dashed and, and all those good things. So rounding the corner of the borders is kind of nice because this this is where Tailwind as a shorthand becomes useful, right? If this was CSS, it would probably look something like this. And I'd have to say, I don't know, like 20% maybe or four pixels. But here I can just add the rounded property and I can start adding modifiers like medium or large. And Tailwind CSS has come up with like relatively nice settings for these. So this is where this uh, starts to become really useful. Um, and I need, uh, I need some space here between these different elements. So let's add maybe a little bit of margin between tomorrow is cloudy and the button class. So, and note the really nice VS code autocomplete that we get here. I just need to do M for margin and then dash zero, one, two, and note that this is in, in rem. So let's see what this looks like. So now we have a ton of margin. That's probably too much. Let's try margin five, right? And even that's a lot. Let's try margin three, right? Much more reasonable, but maybe I only want margin on the bottom. So I can do margin Y as in X and Y. And uh, I apologize, I think I have my syntax wrong here. So give me just a minute to make sure I have this right. I don't want the space. And that makes sense if we think about how um, Tailwind syntax is, where generally the stuff in between the dashes is the name of the thing that we're modifying. And let's go ahead and look at this paragraph element so we can see what's going on here. And if we do, and let me scroll down so we can see our box model all the way down here. I can see that I've added a margin just on the top and the bottom. So here, margin Y as in top and bottom, as in the Y axis. And for instance, here on this button, let's pretend we wanted margins on the left and right side, margin X axis. And what I can also do is like, maybe what I really want is I just want margin on the bottom. So I can do margin bottom. 
And maybe I want some margin on the left or the right side, so I could do margin left. And again, all of these margin units are in REMS, so they're all going to be proportional to whatever we've set as the default font size for our document. So whatever changes we apply will always be proportional, which is really useful. And maybe our button needs some padding too. And again, we just do P for padding the same way that we did M for margin. And now there's padding around everything. Maybe I want um, for my paragraph, maybe I just want some padding on the bottom for some reason, so I can just do that as well. And I just wanna check in to see if folks have any questions around margin or, or padding or border. Cool. Okay, let's start to look a bit more at um, some of the flex, the, the not Flexbox, though we'll look at that, responsive design and Flexbox features of, um, of, of Tailwind, and then we'll take a break and dive into Bootstrap. So I can set width and height, and let me just go ahead and um, comment some of this stuff out. And we'll add some Tailwind examples for responsive design right here. And let's just add a div. And let's just say this is stuff. We want this to be like a big centered message, right? And and we're not there yet, but that's that that's our goal. We want a nice, big, centered message. So I can use um, width and height classes that I get with Tailwind to accomplish some of this. And let's see what that looks like. And let me actually pull up the Tailwind docs here because they actually have a very nice diagram that I do want to show. So again, we can see that the classes are just W and undoubtedly for height, it will just be H. Um, note that if, if I want a width in pixels, I can do W dash PX. Otherwise it will be in, in REMS. Um, and here I have a really nice visual diagram just showing the different widths of, of these different um, classes. And I can also use percentage widths. And that's what we're going to take a look at in just a moment to see what that looks like. And let me just go ahead and add in a non-percentage width just so we can see what, what that looks like. And let me go ahead and copy this. And we're going to call this uh, non percentage with, and we'll add a class name here. And maybe with 25. And let's add a border to it so we can see it as well. Um, and I admit this is where my tailwind skills being a little rusty um, and we need the border uh, with settings as well. I'm in fact looking at the code we just wrote a minute ago as a guide. Now, right now we're not gonna see, it's gonna take up the full length no matter what, right? Because we have um, a div that that's a block. Um, if I made this say a span, we would see that change, but we can do this. Let's do this maybe with, with height. That might be a little more interesting. Okay. 
actually, I'm a little surprised we're not seeing the height change there. Let's see what's what's going on. So let me do a quick sanity check and make sure that I'm actually using height correctly. And I should be, let's try using a value lower than, let's try like H10 and see if that impacts it. There we go. So I H50 just may not exist, but height 40 and so on and so forth. So let's set this back to H10, something a, a little more reasonable. Um. So let's look now though at how to do some of this responsive design stuff. And the Tailwind docs actually give us a really nice hint here. Um, we can use W-fraction or W-full to set an element to a percentage base width. And we can see this in action here. Um, we can also use the class WScreen to make an element span the entire width of the viewport. And so let's actually sort of break the rules a little bit and let's have the root div for our React app span the whole width of the viewport just to make sure that um, it does indeed take up the full width and then all of our other widths will be correctly relative. Um, so let me just go into index.html and let's add it here. And I don't think you'll need to do this very often, but for demonstration purposes, um, I think it is useful. And let's see, I may need to kill and restart my dev server. And it does look like I'm getting Adam, that went into your ID. Oh yeah, thank you so much. That would that would exactly be it. Sorry guys. And here, in fact, it's got to be class because this is not. There we go. And now we actually see this extends all the way to the to the end. And let's kill and restart this just for sanity. So now we should be able to use these proportional widths um, and they should work out very nicely. So let's create a couple divs with these and, and see, what, see what they look like. So our big centered message, we probably want to be withful. And indeed it is taking up the full length. And let's try maybe adding like message one and message two. And if we look here and let's add some border to it so we can see it in action in fact. And let's make message to be what maybe uh let's actually make this be one quarter. Message two can be one half. Message three can be three fourths. Right. And so you can start to see the value of having really like a design system. This isn't quite a full on grid system, but where things are are laid out and laid out proportionally. And because all of this is based on the viewport size, as this shrinks or grows, we see this shrink and grow as well.
so let me demonstrate a little bit of Flexbox here with this. And then I think that'll be a good stopping point where we can break and take some questions and then switch gears and start looking at um, looking at Bootstrap. So I'm just going to go ahead and put all of this inside a flex box, a div that's going to be my Flexbox container. And that's going to look like this, where the class name is just Flex. And note, all of a sudden, Flexbox is getting applied for all of these things. So actually, maybe right our full width message, we don't want to be part of the Flexbox. And now we get to apply all sorts of interesting rules and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave that stuff outside the flex. Sorry about that. So that we it's there for for reference. And let me rename these real quick. And let's get rid of these relative widths, or excuse me, these fixed widths, and let's use some Flexbox style classes. And let me get rid of this as well. So now we sort of see the Flexbox that we're a bit more used to, right? Where we have the container div and it applies Flexbox to all the things inside of it. Um, now, interestingly, we get some really useful classes for rows and columns. And let's see what this looks like. And let me get rid of those empty spaces just for sanity. So, this is sort of similar to the flex row that we've seen before, but like we saw the other day with Flexbox, where we can do things like reverse the row, um, we have those as well. We also have flex column, if we want to turn these into a column. And of course, we could also reverse that if, if we wanted to. And then what we can also do to control sizes is what Tailwind calls a flex basis. And let me get rid of this and we'll be using flex rows by default. And basis sets the initial size of our flex boxes. And like everything else in Tailwind, it's separated with a dash. And so we see that what's happening here is this first box in our flex box takes up a half of the row. And I'm curious if we do flex column, let's see what happens. So there's no containing size there, so it doesn't really apply as much. Um, but this is where this starts to become really useful. Right, because maybe I want the this to be one fourth, and maybe I want this one to be one half, and I want this one to be one fourth too. And this last one to be, oh, I've got five in there, and that's the problem. Or rather, I'm so sorry, these are taking up. So let's make this maybe like one eighth and one eighth. And then let's make this one one fourth. And now that should all fit. So 
interestingly, I would have expected not quite sure what's causing this discrepancy there. I might just be missing something in my numbers, but we can see here the flex box being applied, right? As we size this and the relative sizes, which is really powerful. Um, I think there are, there are classes too for controlling, growing, and shrinking with Flexbox. Um, I think that's like a bit more advanced that we don't need to dig into that right now. Um, but again, as you're doing Flexbox, the, the Tailwind docs are extremely good and where I would recommend going to uh, for all of these things. Like if we just start looking up Flex, we can see that they kind of lay out everything that I was looking at here. Um, things like if we want an item to shrink, but not to grow, to control relative sizes and, and all sorts of useful, useful things. Um, and then I think the last thing I want to show is just using pseudo classes. And let's actually just do a quick search through their docs for that. And we can see what that looks like here. So, and let's see where, let's see if they have hover in the docs. I think that would be a good one to see. So this is actually good to see for an input field. Like we can modify placeholder text as well with the pseudo class. And just to demonstrate what a hover might look like, let's just put a hover over um, our big centered message. And it looks somewhat similar to what we've seen with CSS where we use the colon and that's how you tell that we've got a pseudo class. And we're going to say, when we hover over this, set the background to be blue. And so all of the normal pseudo classes that you can use, you can do um, with Tailwind as well. So I just want to pause and check in and see um, what questions folks have. And let me catch up on whiskey questions as well. Um, I see on index HTML you use class XYZ for your class name. I think that might have just been a holdover from something. Landon, did we did we address that? We did. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Uh, yeah. What other questions do folks have? Cool. I think my question is. Do you all feel like you can kind of see like the direct utility of, of Tailwind as you're writing React apps and using CSS? Okay, awesome. Um, so as you can see, Tailwind has a whole lot of features. Again, I just keep the docs open as I use it. And when I need to figure out how I want to do something, then, then I search for it. Um, I think where you're going to get the most bang for your buck with Tailwind is, well, really with everything, but definitely with the basics, like text colors, margin, padding, font size, um, and Flexbox as well, I think, unless you end up using Bootstrap. You can use Tailwind with Bootstrap, but we'll see Bootstrap also has like a sort of Flexbox grid system. And I would be just a little careful. And we'll we'll talk about that when we get into Bootstrap. 
So let's take 10. Um, actually, let me go ahead and pause the recording and we'll take a break and then we'll look at Bootstrap. So Bootstrap is sort of like philosophically the opposite of, of Tailwind. Tailwind gives us these very flexible, simple utility classes that, that use the CSS that we know and love, but do a little bit of the work for us. And really more than a little bit when it comes to making everything proportional with, with our REMs and, and things like that. And it does have some more sophisticated behaviors like a, you can implement a dark mode with it and, and stuff with like peers and groups that I'll, I'll kind of circle back to. Bootstrap is like the, the whole Megillah batteries included. There's very powerful color theming. The components have a lot of built-in behavior. There's like JavaScript interactivity. Um, and it's it's been around for, for ages. Um, so like if we were installing Bootstrap on a non-React project, we would, there are a couple options we would need to include the CSS for Bootstrap and the JavaScript because there's a lot of JavaScript for some of the interactive components that we'll we'll see, and that they kind of list and talk about here, like alerts, a carousel, collapsing, modals. Since we're using React and we want to do stuff the React way, luckily there is an official React Bootstrap library that is Bootstrap, but um, set up so we can use React components with Bootstrap, which is honestly pretty great. And that is what we are going to go ahead and use. And I am actually going to go ahead and create like a new project for that. Um, because I, I did misspeak a little bit earlier. I'm not, we do need to be careful about mixing Tailwind and, and Bootstrap. Like Francisco, I don't know if you know, but my guess is that they might not play nice together. And, and the reason I suspect that is um, because they're both doing all this sort of pre-processing and what do we, we have like CSS class names that conflict or something. So for now, I would recommend picking one and using it. And I'll, I'll follow up with after class to confirm that, um, but I'm, I'm relatively sure. So let me very quickly just spin up a new React project so that we can install bootstrap and see it fresh. And I'm going to run npm install. I'm going to run npm run dev just as a sanity check. And if we do a hard refresh here, we see now we've got the fresh React project. And if we go to the React bootstrap site and we go to getting started, installation, Renault is really simple. We just need to install React Bootstrap. Um, this is vanilla Bootstrap. We don't need to do this. So all we got to do is install React Bootstrap. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. I'm going to make sure I'm in the right directory. And npm install React Bootstrap. So. Bootstrap is the underlying NPM package that contains the CSS and the JavaScript for Bootstrap. And React is the NPM package that bundles that all up in React components that we can use really nicely. So let's now see how to configure our React project to use React Bootstrap. And it is pretty straightforward. I just need to go into main.jsx and we need to import the bootstrap css which has been installed from the react bootstrap npm package um and in fact like if you go into node modules here we'll see i thought bootstrap was installed uh it's not we will see, if, uh, is there an extra step? I think perhaps we do want to install Bootstrap as well. It's, 
Yeah, we, I, I apologize. I missed the step here. We should install Bootstrap as well. Um, so let's go ahead and just install Bootstrap. And this is the NPM package that actually contains the CSS and the JavaScript and stuff. And now if I like go inside my node modules here, I see Bootstrap. And if we look inside here, we can see all of the CSS, though that is, and there's a whole lot of CSS, right? Uh, there's a lot of default stylings. There's a lot of default JavaScript behaviors, and that's sort of the power of a bootstrap. And now that I've installed that, I'm going to go ahead and import from that NPM package, from that dist directory, the CSS, the minified compressed version of the Bootstrap CSS. Because we do need that so that when we use our React Bootstrap components, the CSS they expect will be there. And I am going to go ahead and do the traditional, let's delete all the stuff I don't want here. And let's delete all that stuff and all that stuff. And we'll just put a return and a fragment and an H1 that says, hello world. And I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of all this other CSS as well. And now I've got a nice clean project to work from. And it would help if I ran the dev server. And so note that we have some default styles applied here already from Bootstrap. As I think it was Saul noted, um, Tailwind did not give H1 like a font size by default. Bootstrap is very much batteries included. And um, we'll note that it is, though the font size is being calculated based on rem and view width and, and stuff. Um, but we can see that all this bootstrap CSS got installed, which some people really like, some people dislike. It's great for when you need it. It's great for getting projects going. I, I'm generally a fan of it. Um, and you can change and set a lot of these styles. Some people do very much like like to roll their own though. So it, it 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 does just depend. So we get a lot of things right out of the box. It bootstrap. Uh, I don't want to put that there with the input. And note that a button has styling as well. And in fact, Bootstrap even put the button next to the, the input tag for us. So I think I have my font size bumped up a bit um, on the browser. So all of this is maybe a bit bigger, like that button looks awfully big. But Bootstrap has a lot of built-in stylings. Um, but even more so, it has a lot of built-in behavior, and that's where it starts to get interesting. And in fact, let's look at the React Bootstrap docs, because you really need to read the docs to use Bootstrap. Um, there are all these different React components, and in fact, instead of the button tag, I should be using the button component from React Bootstrap. So let me go ahead and do that now, and let's see what that looks like.
So I need to import the button component. I note that it's um, a named import. Like this says there are multiple things we can export from the React Bootstrap package. So as I add more things here, like we'll see eventually there will be like nav bars and stuff like that. Um, it'll get added here, but we can do the curly brackets. Um, I can also import this way if I want. I can import directly from the file containing the component. I think it's really personal preference, though. It, I They do actually recommend importing individual components. So I, I take that back. We actually should do it this way. And the reason is this way, it, we only import what we need. Um, the other way possibly imports a bit more stuff. So let's go ahead and change this and see what this starts to look like. And let me go back over here. And so this button looks dramatically different now, right? This is like the classic bootstrap blue. And um, there's all sorts of stuff that we can do to it. So with bootstrap, you really have to read the docs. You really have to read the docs to see how to use it because each component has a lot of behaviors that are very powerful. For instance, know all these different variants that we can use. right, that have a lot of built-in stuff. If we further look at the button component, and there's a live editor here, so we can actually change this stuff. Um, note, there's even more that we can do. I could do like outline, different kinds of outline buttons, outline primary, outline secondary, and again, this is a live editor, so I do recommend just interacting with this um, as you get familiar with Bootstrap. There's things like button tags, like if I want this to be a link instead of a button, I can add an href, and now it looks like a button, but it acts like a link. Um, same with all of these other kinds of behaviors and you could add values to them though. I don't know if I can actually type, I can't actually type and modify this, but this button component can work as an input field, um, as a button that you click or you submit and so on. Um, Bootstrap has baked in a lot of stuff for usability for screen readers or different color schemes. Um, without going into it, there's a whole set of web standards called ARIA to make websites readable for people with, with various disabilities. And um, in, in particular, the blind and with screen readers and, and Bootstrap bakes in a lot of that for you. Note that we have these button sizes and we can add that as an attribute. And let me go ahead and do that right now. And let's just go ahead and do, I believe it is size equals LG for large. And now that is a really big button. This is a much smaller one. So this is a prop on our button component. And again, there's really no way to, to, to know this stuff unless you kind of read through the docs. Um, we can make full width block buttons. Though we'll get to this because I believe this is using the bootstrap grid. So we'll get to that one later. Um, this is a good example of how powerful bootstrap is. Um, we can set a button to have an active or not active state. I think active means it's already been clicked. So maybe if we wanted some sort of toggle, 
very usefully, there's a built-in disabled behavior so that this button cannot be clicked. And to do that, this is a shorthand for a prop that is a Boolean. This is the same thing as this. Uh, but what React does is, because it's a Boolean, if it's there, it's true. If it's not, it's false. So now I can't click this button. So maybe I write some logic with a little bit of React component state so that you can't hit the submit button until you've filled out all the fields on the form. You can add a loading state to a button, though this is a bit more complex, but they walk you through how to do it. Um, and, and so on and so forth. So as you can see, and, and this isn't even getting into like button groups and toggle buttons, um, it, Bootstrap is just very powerful and it gives you a lot right out the box. And let's just go ahead and add our onclick handler for this button. just to watch the button work, right? And now I can click a button. And uh, if it, so actually this isn't working because it's disabled, right? So maybe, I do something like this. And it would help if I imported the use state hook. So let's go ahead and do that. So now I'm using my component state to set whether a button is disabled or not. So I just want to check in and see what uh, questions folks have. Okay, cool. Um, I'm not going to get too much into forms because there are some other things I, I want to cover, but just like with uh, buttons, uh, React Bootstrap has some very powerful form components, including validation and a whole lot of styling. Again, this is a live um, demo. And you can see here that you can form, form groups and you can add labels. Um, And, and all of this applies a whole bunch of CSS styles designed to work together. Um, so forms could be something good to look at for, for the afternoon. Um, again, I don't want to dig into it too much. Again, you can disable an entire form um, using that disabled property. Um, I'm just going to show a couple of components as highlights and then get into the grid, which is one of the most powerful things that Bootstrap gives us. Um, so there's a ton of components here. Does anyone have a, maybe a component in particular that they're curious about? I don't know if anyone's gotten a chance to poke around at, at this at all. Carousel. Carousel. Love it. The carousel is a classic, right? For clicking through slides, clicking through images of something. And actually, it looks like they even include with Bootstrap an example carousel image. So this is a lot of stuff, as we can see here. There's the carousel class. 
there's carousel item, there's all these other things. But let's just start with the basics. I can see that I need to import carousel and import example carousel image. So let me go ahead and import these two things. I get some really nice um, autocomplete, though I do have to be careful that I import from React Bootstrap and not the and not the Bootstrap library. And again, each component will have its own file, really, that we're importing from. And here, it looks like, I apologize, this did not come from React. This is something that they put together, it looks like. So I'm not going to mess with that. And if I look at the carousel, I see that um, the way I use this comp component is a little complex, because sort of like when we've imported classes, using the dot convention, there's there's other React classes for me to access here. So let's try just making a carousel and making like two carousel items. And we'll see how, how well this goes and how far this takes us. So this isn't a bad start. Uh, I see item one. If I click on it, I see item two, but it's a little hard to tell what's going on there. There's actually, it's hiding, but there is a little arrow button there, but I just can't see it because it's it's white. And part of the problem is I don't have an image asset here. So let's look at the docs a bit more to see how, how we're supposed to use this. And maybe we can flesh this out. Um, and let's maybe read the docs a little bit to see if it has any advice. A slideshow component for cycling through elements, images or slides of text like a, like a carousel. Carousels don't normalize dimensions, blah, 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 blah. There's captions here that look like labels. There's text here. so. You can, we can control the carousel state. There's a whole bunch of things here. There's crossfading. Let's try just maybe adding some stuff inside the carousel because it kind of looks like it's meant to take another component. Maybe we add a div and an H1. And let's see how far this gets us. So that looks a bit more like what we want. And now, of, of course, the fact that I um, I don't have a Tailwind here, I can't very easily and quickly use their really nice classes to set, say, like background colors and stuff. But let's see um, what React Bootstrap gives us as we keep kind of scrolling through these carousel docs. Um, we can try variant dark that might help make it easier to read. And it looks like we add it this way. So I'm just gonna copy this bit of code and let's see what that does for our carousel. And let me make sure I get this right. data dash BS dash theme. Let's see if that does it. Oh, 
that's actually in the wrong spot. I apologize. So, right, this UI does not look very nice, but now we can see the arrows and these, and, and these aren't really sized appropriately, probably because we don't have image assets and we haven't been like setting an overall layout for our site, but we can see the carousel in action. Um, and we can see it's sort of expecting to have an image asset in there. And, and then when you get to the bottom of each one, you'll see like the full API for each component, which is really useful as there's a lot of details and, and controls here. Like we can hook into what happens when the active item changes, when it slides, um, whether the carousel should respond to keyboard commands or all sorts of things. And I don't know if we can use this with the carousel, but a great component to show is the card. Um, and a card is designed to give us, as you can kind of see here, like some text laid out a lot like we would see, say, on the Etsy site, where maybe there's an image and a description and a title and then a button. So let's build a card real quick. I don't know if we can use it in the carousel, but let's see. So let's make our card here. And I do recommend using the React Bootstrap docs as guide code. I don't recommend copying and pasting. Otherwise, you'll end up copying and pasting stuff that you don't really understand what it does. And I am going to cheat a bit here and use some um, inline styles. And they might be doing a little bit of CSS in JS magic here um, just to give us uh, a size to our card. And I don't have an image for my card, but I will have a title. And there we go. And I will have note that the card has a body. And in fact, the title needs to go within the body because if I had an image, it would go up there. And let's put some text in here and let's have it be just Laura. I think I'm not getting the autocomplete on Lorem here, unfortunately. And let's go ahead and add a button as well. Let's see what this card looks like. So obviously we might, might want to control and modify these styles more, but this is actually pretty, pretty darn useful. Um, and in fact, if we want to maybe grab like a cat image, Let's just grab that one as a cat if it's of a decent size and that looks perfect. So I'm going to use this card image card and then maybe we can use the cat for our slide deck as well. And that's an awfully long image tag, but that is okay. And let's see if this renders. And now I've got my cat card. And in fact, let's go ahead and let's throw the cat in our carousel so we can just see that working as well. And if I refer back to the guide code, I see here, 
Um, it looks like they don't really, we can put really whatever we want inside the carousel caption there. So in fact, let's see if our whole card will work inside the carousel. I'm just gonna go ahead and copy it. And let's put it inside carousel one. And I do think that worked. And now we've got um, a card in our carousel. Though apparently I suspect it's the difference of size between the two that's maybe causing a little weirdness. But you can see how the, you can start to use these different pieces together, right? Like you could use cards. If we had two cards in here, and in fact, let's just get rid of this second one, the second carousel item. And let's just duplicate this first one. And now this should make a lot more sense. And indeed, it's a lot smoother. And now we have our e-commerce site where you can, you know, buy cats. Um, I just want to pause and check in and see if folks have any questions. Okay, awesome. So I, I'm i gonna dive into the grid. I just very, well, actually I'll show the nav bar and then the grid. I just very quickly want to point out a couple other really useful components in Bootstrap. The accordion is really useful and, and not that, that difficult. And note this pattern of the parent component accordion.item, we see that again, and a header and a body. And I also want to point out the dropdown component. Um, excuse me. And note that there's the dropdown component uh, but then we have to create the menu and the different items. And that we've added a sort of toggle button here to hide or show the different items. And we can see that there's a lot of options with this, which is part of the power of, of, of Bootstrap. We can have that split button. Um, and with all of these, there, there's an on-click handler. Um, and so Bootstrap gives you an awful lot of control, right? And dark theme and um, We'll see this in the nav bar in a moment. So what's really useful and that what you, you've all seen in layouts is a nav bar. And Bootstrap has an incredibly powerful nav bar. It is a bit more complex, as we'll see. As you can see, even their, their basic example has a lot of stuff in it. But first off, the great thing is we have a nice example here and everything in Bootstrap is going to be responsive or as responsive as it can be. We don't have a lot of responsive stuff happening here. But note that with that example nav bar, when there's room on the screen, we see the full nav bar, but because Bootstrap has a lot of built-in media query breakpoints, when we hit a certain screen size, it switches to a different kind of nav bar. And in fact, if we go look at the layout here, they tell us what their breakpoints are, extra small, small, medium, large, and extra large. So it doesn't correspond directly to like phones and tablets, but 
these these pixel sizes definitely do are, are related to like your average phone size and stuff like that. And depending on when you trip one of these breakpoints in your screen size, uh, the components will render in different ways like we saw with the NAMPAR. And so that's a big advantage of a bootstrap that this relatively complex thing, like a nav bar with multiple components, right? We have links, we have a drop down, uh, is not just responsive in terms of shrinking size, but the breakpoint is set, and then it gets the drop down. All of this gets replaced with the hamburger button. So that's part, again, a good example of why a lot of people really like using Bootstrap. Um, now, to get this to work, we do have to use a container for some layout, which I'll talk about in a minute. But let's go ahead and implement some of this piece by piece and, and break it down. And I think what I'll do is I'll make a components folder. And inside there, I'll make a file and we'll call it my navbar.jsx and we'll build it up in here. And we'll build up the really simplest version because this has so many moving parts. And talk through it as we go. So first off, I'm going to need to import and here, I think I will do a little bit of copying and pasting just in the interest of time and simplicity. And this is always the danger of copying and pasting. But now I've got my nav bar. And I'm just going to say nav bar. And go ahead and import it up at the top here. And I'm only going to get to, I think, the very basics of the nav bar because I want to make sure to cover Bootstrap's grid, which is really powerful. So if I scroll up top, the nav bar component is rendering, which is what I want. And now let's build it out. So I need the parent nav bar component. So I'm not going to need the fragments anymore. And we're going to do nav bar. And everything is going to live inside here. And there's this property expand. And if we look it up, I'm pretty darn sure it will determine how large across the screen the nav bar should expand. And there's all these things in here, but we need to use a bootstrap container, which I'll talk about in a moment when we talk about the grid and layout. But let's go ahead and add that container now because we know that everything else will go inside it. And if we look, we see there's a, a, a brand and a toggle and a collapse and a nav bar drop down line item and ink link and all these different things, but let's just keep it really, really simple. Um, let's add the nav bar dot brand and see what it does. And this is a link. When you see sites, like right here, React Bootstrap. This is the Bootstrap nav bar, and that's a nav bar dot brand. And yes, you can put a search box in here. And note, in fact, that this is kind of expecting some sort of image. Um, the cat logo is probably too big but maybe we can find like a really little one.
that it's probably also too big, but let's see what we can do. So, well, actually, I'm, I apologize. I'm not going to worry about the image too much right now because I don't want to go down too much of, of a rabbit hole. Um, let's just start by adding in some, some nav bar links. Um, and note, by the way, we have a really nice breakdown of the nav bar here. They give us some nice instructions. Nav bars and their contents are fluid by default. Use optional containers to limit their horizontal width. And if we look at the nav bar, it, it indeed does stretch across the whole screen. Uh, it tells us to use spacing and flex utilities, so we'll learn how to do that. But right now, I think I want to link like this home link right here. And if I look, I see that's nav.link. So let's in let's add in some nav.links and and see what the, that looks like, even though these links won't go anywhere. And note that there's some sort of um, flex box, you know, ju justifying an alignment happening here in that this is being spread across the nav bar. And that all of this works perfectly fine as a nav bar. And if we shrink this, we don't see the cool shrinking action happening yet but we'll get there. So I do note that these nav links are included inside this interestingly named navbar.claps component. And if I had to guess, my guess would be that that tells the navbar what to claps. And here, in fact, we see some descriptions of um, each of these components of the brand components. Uh, we can add forms inside the nav bar. We can add links inside the nav bar. Um, loose text and links can be wrapped nav bar dot text to align it vertically. There's even a color scheme. So there's all this stuff that we can do. Um, let's see if they talk about the claps anywhere. And I'm not seeing it, but I'm pretty darn sure I know what it does. So let's just go back to our main example and then add it on in. So let's do navbar dot claps and let's put all of these inside it and see what happens with my navbar now. Though it does look like they're hidden. So there may have been something I missed here with the nav bar claps. If so, I apologize. Let's actually do a quick search here. I suspect there's some sort of show hide behavior that I was just missing. And actually down here, there's the navbar claps description. Um, let me let me get back to the navbar claps because I would have thought that we would have just seen everything. I don't think these IDs are what's relevant. Um, yeah, let me follow up on that to make sure that I have that behavior right. And I do uh, apologize about that. 
Um, so let me let me come back to that one and see if I can't get that one. See if I can't get that one working. Um, but we can see the navbar links. Uh, there's a whole way of doing navbar dropdowns, which I'm not going to get into right now. Um, it might be, I might need the nav component. There is this nav component. inside here. Um, let's see if that solves it. And then if not, we'll, we'll, we'll move forward. No, unfortunately not. So I apologize, folks. I'll, I'll circle back to this to get a nice minimum implementation working. Um, but we can see at least. How you can set the nav bar and display things across it. Uh, there's also things like, I believe it was position. So you can fix the nav bar to the top or the bottom of the screen. You can make it sticky to the top or the bottom if we scroll. So right now it's fixed to the, I don't think changing fixed top will change anything, but if we, if we do this and just see what happens. Right, so that actually does make a change in the nav bar is fixed to the top and it looks like it's been pulled out of the document flow. Um, We could also fix the nav bar to the bottom of the screen where it's always going to be there as, as well. And then I'm curious, let's see what sticky top does. Right, so that's a bit more useful. So there's some really interesting and powerful behaviors there with the nav bar. Um, And if anything, though, hopefully, as you're working with Bootstrap, this process that I've been using of, like, I did not just go and copy this whole example here because there's way too much going on, is is useful as you're as you're trying this out. Um, like, I'm pretty sure five minutes of digging in the docs and reading about Namvar collapse would solve the issue, but I don't want to um, go down that rabbit hole right now. Um, I do just want to pause and check in and see um, if folks have any questions before we move on to um, the grid. And I do see actually a question in the chat. Um, would it be beneficial to create different JSX files for different components like the header, the body, the footer, and so on, and place those in the components folder? Uh, yes, absolutely. That is a great question, Michael, and a really common pattern. Uh, like we could very well name this header the way that I have it here in components. And so you will often build up your sort of page template components and you will have, you might have a page component, though often like what you'll end up with is you'll make a pages directory and you'll have components in here and you might have a component for each page, but then each page uses the header component and the footer component and so on. Does that answer your question, Michael? Yes, and that makes sense since it's components we're utilizing and also why uh, Francisco made that pages folder for that assignment, that assessment practice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's for, for HTML, but that's the same idea. Um, let's take a look at the grid and then this will be the last 10 minutes or so of, of our lecture. So Bootstrap's grid and container system is really, really powerful. And let me just go ahead and let's use it here and see it in action. So let me go ahead and just import what I need real quick. So we're going to import container from 
React Bootstrap slash container. Whenever you're working with Bootstrap's grid, you're going to need containers, rows, and columns. And let's add some of these in and kind of watch it in action. So let's say, let's put the container here and let's put all this stuff inside the container. Um, Actually, let me let me just comment all this stuff out so that we can have a clean example of, of containers, rows, and columns. And maybe I'll move it out into separate components at the end of the lecture. Because otherwise I think it'll be a bit messy considering all the all the stuff that we have. So the containers for a, usually you use it for a grid system. And let's see, what are we not liking here? I think, did I comment out the closing fragment? Uh, I think that it start to your nav bars outside of your comments, and then you have two containers opening, but nothing closing. Oh, thank you so much. It's probably that I missed the closing tag on the container. I bet that was the issue. Your nav bar is still open, but it doesn't close? Uh, that one's okay, because that is, it, it, it's the, the style where you see the HTML element where you don't need a closing tag. You've got the slash right here, which indicates that you only need the one tag and, and it's, it's self-closing, so to speak. Um, which is normal with most React components. What we're seeing here is really sort of a, a parent child component setup with containers, which we'll talk about a bit later with React. But let's just make a couple divs. just item one and item two. And let's watch what happens as we put these inside the container. So note that first thing that happens is if I put a div inside the container, some sort of centering is going on. And if we go ahead and we look at the container class, we can kind of see what happens is that the container has created this centered space both with uh, margins and padding. And if I add this property fluid to the container and we look at it now, I can see that it's gotten rid of, uh, I believe it got rid of the margins. Yeah, so if you want, if you don't want that margins, like if you think of like a blog post where the text is centered, that's kind of what's happening here, right? And let's go ahead and add the second div in. And so we see we've got these two columns right now, but now let's add in the row element. And let's see what happens as we add these in. So nothing yet but let's see what happens as we add these into rows and columns. And so now if I'm using the row and column components, then much like Flexbox, whatever I'm putting in here gets put in the row. And note that the more stuff I put in here, um, the more the container handles it, right? And if we did 
fluid, then this would be stretched across the whole length. Um, and you very much can nest these things within each other. Like I might want a row and maybe I want like, or even better, let's see if, let me close that row out, I apologize. Let's make another row. And if we look at our container, we can see what these rows look like. And our second row doesn't have anything in it right now. Um, but maybe I want this row to have two columns. But maybe inside each of those columns, I'm going to put another row. And let's put like four columns inside there. And let's go ahead and do that here as well. And maybe I actually want like two rows of stuff Right, so you, there's just a, a lot of control that you get with the bootstrap grid, a lot of, of control that you get. And so people find it really, really useful because it does a lot of this work for you. Um, and if we kind of look through the grid system, um, like you can set, different breakpoints, especially if you're using the fluid setting um, so that the container is fluid until a specific size. For instance, all of this is going to be pretty responsive. But maybe Let me get uh, the setting right here. When it gets really big, maybe I want it to be fluid. Like, I think it takes, like right there, it's a little hard to see, but no, I'm expanding. And this is the large size. And I, in fact, I think if I do, let's see if that does it, because there's large and extra large. No, that's not quite right. Um, but you can see that specifically, for the large breakpoint, this is fluid. And then it might still be fluid, extra large, it's just really big. And then when we get to medium, fluid is gone and, and that margin is gone. Um, so that can be really, really powerful. Um, you've also got a lot of auto layout behavior options with your columns, as, as you can see here. Um, and you sort of saw me showing that example. You can also set specific column sizes and specific row sizes, uh, or rather just column sizes, because rows wouldn't make so much sense. And I'm not sure if there's actually a good example here with the way it's laid out, but I could say that once this shrinks down to a certain size, each column size should become something else, like should become 
a, a certain minimum size. Um, the variable width content, the responsive grids are really powerful. Um, This is maybe a good example, like when this gets extra small, maybe we want it to have a size of two. And note that those columns, they're now wrapping and they went vertical. And I believe the grid, I believe it's like the, the grid size I wanna say is 12 across. I think that's sort of your standard grid setting. And let's do the same thing here. So this gives us a lot of control over our layout, right? As soon as it gets bigger, it goes back to full to full size. So that's a really powerful feature right there. Um, like these are all wrapped inside a row. So I'm not sure we can we can do it with the row, but there are ways to do that uh, with rows as well. Um, and you can set multiple breakpoints. Like here, for example, you can set different sizes. So maybe I want to make sure that like this column for like large screen sizes takes up the full size of all twelve, uh, the full twelve length of the grid. And it's being a bit limited, I think, by its partners there. But this gives you a lot of control over the layout of your page and is how a lot of like responsive designs are built. And it is a big part of the reason why people like, like Bootstrap. Um, so this is definitely worth some digging into. As you can see, it's a little different than, um, than Tailwind with, with Flexbox. Um, and rows do give you breakpoints as well. And actually, this is a good one to see. And let's use these two, four, six settings and, and see what happens when we when we do this. So for this first row, let's say uh, for extra small, maybe it's two. Let's say for small, it's also two. Let's say for medium, it's six. Let's say for large, it's 12. And remember the width of the grid is, is 12. And then extra large is also going to be 12. And so as soon as we start shrinking, item three drops down there, right? And then as soon as there's room, when we hit the large size, it's it's brought back up. And I think, uh, let's see here, we've got three columns within this row. This is maybe a good one to do it with as, as well. Let's do Excel equals 12 and large equals 12. and maybe medium equals six and, and see what that looks like.
And so we just see that more collapsing is happening sooner. So that that's really, I think, the last bit that I wanted to show. And I think the examples here actually do a really good job of showing what like some different responsive layouts are look like. But this grid system of, of a width of 12 and rows and columns where you can set these various breakpoints is, is really powerful. Um, and I'll try to clean this up a bit before sending the code up. Uh, but I just want to check in and see what questions folks have around um, the bootstrap grid system. And I think maybe just to kind of put a closing bow on this, like let's go ahead and copy the card that we made before. And maybe for our very first row here, instead of these three items, let's put in the card. And see what the grid does. And I think I might need to get rid of the width setting on this card. I have a feeling like that might be messing it up now that we have the cat image in there. So now if we look at our grid, we can see each cat in the row. And if we kind of spread this out, we can see what happens. Um, if I take away those different rules about um, the row sizing, then these take up different lengths. And we could set different rules for the column as, as well. And there's actually a way to set, uh, there should be a way to set breakpoints So I may, that one I think I'll, I will come back to. Um, but here we can see the cats there and they get a little ridiculously huge. So, you know, maybe we say like for large, like we only want the cat. So even three is massive. So here with the card in here, we're actually probably just best off taking advantage of um, the responsive nature of the grid. Um, but for different size content, we would have a bit more control. And like we, in fact, in the card itself, we might want to make some changes to the, the button sizes. Um, but yeah, that's, that's probably a good stopping point. Um, just to kind of see more of the React grid in, or the Bootstrap grid in action. Um, and so your assignment for today should be a fun one. Um, there is a reading assignment and, and please do read the bit on, on testing. Um, but really the goal for today is to create a new React project using the tools that you've learned. So you do need to use V and React. You should use use state and use effect. 
Uh, we do want you to interact with a third party API with Axios. And I recommend the Pokemon app. Uh, we do want you to make different components and, and props. Um, and either use Tailwind or um, React Bootstrap. So that's sort of the plan for this afternoon. And let me go ahead and uh, stop the recording.